Hey developers, in this video we will be building a command console for Godot that lets you build commands via nodes and define them with a single function on a handler script. You will also be able to nest commands into groups, calling them with a dot delimited syntax. Alright, we'll start off by stuffing out all the files and folders we'll need. First, create a dedicated folder for the console window. To that, we will add two more folders, one for icons and one for fonts. Next, we're going to create four scenes one for the console window, and three for the components that will make up the commands. For the console window scene, we're going to make it a control type and then change its type to a panel container. And for the three other scenes, the base node type is all that's needed. Lastly, attach a script to each scene and make sure you save everything. Now we're going to get the console UI set up. Go to the console window scene and add a VBox container as a child. Under that, add a scroll container and a line edit. Under the scroll container, add a rich text label. Then rename the rich text label to display and rename line edit to input bar. Now if you select the input bar in the scene tree and look under the inspector settings, you'll find a placeholder dropdown where you can add text that displays when the input bar is empty. You can type whatever you want here or leave it blank. If you do type something, I find that an alpha value of 0.4 makes for a better contrast. Also, if you would prefer that your cursor flash when the input bar is selected, like a normal person, then go to the caret dropdown and enable blink. Next, select the display node and return to the inspector, enable scroll following, enable BB code, then go down to the size flags and enable expand for both horizontal and vertical. Finally, go to the scroll container size flags and enable expand for horizontal and vertical there as well. Okay, let's make a theme that we can use to control the appearance of the console. Select the console and look in the inspector for the theme dropdown. You should see an empty theme. Click the empty field and select new theme. At the bottom, you should see a preview for a bunch of UI controls. To the top right of that is a button labeled edit theme. Click that and choose create empty template. Back in the inspector, you should see a bunch of dropdowns under your new template. First, I want you to look for the line edit dropdown and under colors, set a color for both cursor and font. We also need to set a selection color, and I'm using the same color I set for the cursor and font, just with some added transparency. Next, go to the Styles dropdown, and for the Focus Style, create a new Style Box Flat. After you create it, you can click on the field, and it should expand out to additional settings. Under these settings, we're going to set a background color, then under Border Width, we're going to create a one pixel border on each side. Under Border, we're going to set a color, I use the same color for font, then we need to set a content margin, which controls the space around the text field. I found that the values of 5, minus 1, 3, and 2, respectively, work nicely. Once you've done that, go up to the Focus Style and right click on it, make a copy, and paste it into the Normal Style. Now let's configure the panel container, which serves as the backplate for our console. You'll find that there's only one setting, a style, and like before, we'll create a new style box flat. Set the background color. I use the same background color they used for the previous styles. Then add some content margin to all sides. This will effectively create a border around the display and input bar. The last thing we need to do is configure the rich text label. Under Colors, set the default color to be the same color you use for the font and the line edit control, and then make the rest fully transparent since we won't be using them. Go to the Styles and create a new style box flat. Set the background color, border width, and border color to the same settings that you use for line edit. Then for the content margin, use 5, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 respectively. Just copy paste this style into normal and we're done. Scroll back up to your theme, right click, and save. If you run the scene at this point, you should have a console that completely fills the screen and a line edit that you can type in. Now let's add a font. First we're going to grab a font from fonts.google.com. I prefer using monospace fonts for a console, but you don't have to. Just look for a font that, in addition to a regular style, has styles for bold, italics, and bold italics. The font I'm using is IBM Plex Mono. Once you've downloaded your font, open the archive and choose the font that you're going to use for your default. I'm using medium. Then grab the italics for your default pick, then bold and bold italics. Once you've got your selections, drag them into your font folder. Unfortunately, you can't drag them into Godot and you'll have to place them directly in the folder. Luckily, you can open the folder via Godot by right-clicking on the folder and selecting Open in File Manager. 
Once you have your font, go to the console windows theme and at the top you'll see default font. Create a new dynamic font, select it, go to font, and for the font data you will load whatever font you chose to be your default. Once you're done with that, go down to the rich text label, fonts, then for italics, bold, and bold italics, create new dynamic fonts and add the appropriate font data for each. Now save your theme and when you run, you should see your new font reflected in the input bar. It's time to create some icons. These icons aren't absolutely needed, but they're not purely aesthetic either and will be quite useful for building command groups. Just use a graphics editor of your choice and make a simple design like I am here with a 16 by 16 pixel canvas. You can create different icons, but for simplicity, I'm just using different colors. Whatever you choose to do, you're going to want an icon for a command module, a command group, and for the command itself. Once you've created your icons, go to the script files for your three command scenes and add a class name followed by a string path to the respective icon. Unfortunately, I could not find a way to get the icons to update without restarting the editor, so save all of your changes, close the editor, and reopen your project. And if you look at the three command scenes, you should see your icons represented in the tabs and on the scene tree. Alright, what do you say we get some functionality? This first code pass will hook together the UI elements and set the foundation that we'll build upon later. To start, we create variables to store some references to the input bar and display. Then we create a pool string array that will serve as the console message buffer and export a message buffer limit. We will use this limit to dictate how many strings are allowed in the buffer. There are many ways to handle a message buffer and it would be better to handle this on a per line basis rather than a per string basis, but I'm choosing to go with something quick and easy for the simplicity of this tutorial. Next we're going to make two functions, one that lets us push messages to the display and one that lets us clear the display. For pushing messages, we'll just add a string to the message buffer, trim old messages if our size limit is reached, and then use the pool string arrays join function to create a single string from every array element. I want you to notice that I'm setting the display's BB code text here and not regular text because that's where the rich text label looks when BB code is enabled. The last thing we need to do is connect the input bar's text entered signal to the console window. We handle this signal by clearing the input bar and ignoring empty strings. Eventually we'll pass this input to a function for parsing, but for demonstration purposes we'll just push the input message directly to the display. Now if you run the scene you should be able to send messages to the display. This is also a good time to try out the BB codes and make sure they work. It's time to build the command framework. We'll start on the command node itself which will represent the actual command that's entered into the console. The name of the command node will be used as the name of the command and handled in a case insensitive way for simplicity. We're going to start by creating an enum of argument types which we will export as an array. This is how we will define the number of arguments a command expects as well as what type that argument should be. In addition, we'll export a second array of argument names that will be used as a simple descriptor for the argument. This is not required but will improve user experience. By the way, the second argument you see me providing the export here is called an export hint, and they let me tell the engine how to present the data through the inspector. We're going to need a callback that represents a function name for the command. The name of this callback will be automatically generated. I wrap the callback in a setter and getter to help with that automatic generation. For our ready function, we simply make some asserts to ensure compliance when making a command, and force the name to be lowercase. Next we'll write a couple utility functions. The first generates a usage string that can be reported to the user if they use the command incorrectly. The argument name and type arrays are used to create the string. This thing that you see me doing with %s is how you can concatenate strings without a messy chain of plus operators. The second utility function builds a pool string array by starting at the command and walking up the chain of parents until the target is reached. We will use this in conjunction with command groups to create a namespace that will allow us to nest commands. The last function we need to write for this node is a function that will parse the arguments that the command expects to use. The arguments are passed as a single string and split at every space. The resulting array will be used for our arguments, but it would be nice if we could allow spaces through the use of quotation marks, and that's what I'm doing here. This for loop walks through each element of the split arguments and checks whether a particular segment begins or ends with a quotation mark. If it begins with one, we remove the quote and flag that we're building a quote. While we're building the quote, the segments are added to a separate array, and when we encounter a segment that ends with a quotation mark, we join the array into a single argument.
Once we're done parsing the arguments, we do some error checking, returning a string if an error is found. If no error is found, we finish up by walking through the array of completed arguments and casting them to the expected type defined by the user when the command was created. This is done so the proper argument type can be sent to the handler function and used on the spot without the handler function needing to do a conversion of its own. And with that, we're done with the command and we can move on to the command group. Command groups are simple objects that allow you to create commands of the same name by putting them under different groups. We don't really need much code here, just a ready function that asserts that there are no spaces in the name and forces the name to be lowercase. Next, you can copy the get namespace to function from the command node, realize later that you don't actually need it, be unable to remember why you had it there in the first place, then delete it. The last command related code we need to work on is the command module, which is responsible for containing all commands and command groups. Most applications are likely to use a single module with multiple groups, but that's not a requirement. It's worth noting that the command module is ignored when the namespace is generated, so it does not contribute to command nesting. We start by exporting a node path that references the target node which the command functions will live on. By default, the target, denoted by the double dot I use in the string here, is whatever node happens to be this command module's parent. However, you can use this variable to direct the function calls to a different node if you so desire. The module description will be used by the console for generating a help message. Let's quickly tackle the simpler functions first. Generate help string should be pretty self-explanatory, though we do need to go back to the command node and export a help variable. I'm showing you this now because it's totally planned and not something I forgot to do until now. Next, we'll build the command dictionary. This function walks through all the module's children and adds an entry to the dictionary if the child is a command. Otherwise, we call the build function with the child as the new target. The dictionary entry is a reference to the command node and we key it with the fully qualified command name. The last thing we need to do here is handle when a command node is entered. The console will verify that a command module has a command before this function is called. This is why we make an assert on the command node. We then hand the argument string to the command node for parsing and check its return type. If it's a string, then the parse failed and we react accordingly. Otherwise, we check that the command handler has a function of the appropriate name before we call it with a reference to the console and the array of arguments. All that's left to do is the console. First, we need a function that lets us add command modules as well as an array to hold references to said modules. Then we need to properly handle user input. We start by splitting the input once into a command string and argument string. Now that we have the command string, we can search the modules for the command. In order to help keep this tutorial simple, we have not implemented any checks to make sure identical namespaces don't occur, so this will just execute on the first module it finds. If a module is found, we hand the command and arguments off to that module and it handles the rest. All we need to do now is pass the input into our new function and we're finally done. Now let's make some commands. First, we'll make a few simple commands for the console itself. Add a base node to the console window and name it however you want. This will be the node that we use for handling commands. Now attach a script to your new command handler. This will contain your command functions. Next, instantiate a command module and make sure it's a child of the command handler. Name it whatever you want, then instantiate a command as a child of the module. Name your new command echo, select it, and in the inspector, add a name to the argument names, then add a string type to the argument types. Finally, give it a simple help message. Now open the script for your new command handler and add the command module to the console in the ready function. Once you've done that, create a function named on command echo and push the first element of the arguments to the console. If you run the scene, you should be able to type echo followed by some message and see it output to the display. And if you provide the echo command with an invalid number of arguments, it should also show you the usage string. Now I'm going to quickly make a couple more commands, one to clear the screen and one to print a help message. And that's it, you now have a functioning console. Now let me quickly throw together an example scene for you that makes a more practical use of the console.
you'll notice that we can embed the console into another container. It does not have to be full screen. Alright developers, we're nearing the end. I'd like to thank you for watching. This is my first attempt at making a video, and if this rapid format of tutorial is something you'd enjoy seeing more of, please consider leaving a like.